Welcome. In today's video, we'll be implementing functions as special types of relations in Haskell. As such, we'll be building on the material from the last video on relations. And again, I'll start with the definitions that we'll need in order to write our program. The first definition here is that of a function. So here I'm defining a function as a special type of relation. So a function, which we write like this, f going from x to y with just a normal arrow, is just a relation from x to y. So it's a subset of the Cartesian product of x and y. But it has to satisfy a condition. And this is sort of the condition that defines the function. So for every x in the set capital X, there needs to exist a unique y in capital Y, such that the pair x comma y lies in the relation f. So here it's best to just illustrate this definition directly using an example. So here I'm representing my set x and y schematically. And now in x I have certain points. And remember that in the case of a relation, we're going to just draw a bunch of arrows between uh, the points in x and the points in y. But now if we want to define a function, we need to uh, choose our arrows more carefully. So the first part of this definition here says that for every x in x, there exists some uh, y in y such that uh, the pair x, y is in the relation. So this means I have to draw an arrow starting at each point in x. So while in a relation, I can have some points in x that don't have any arrows starting from it, in a function, I need to define the function on every point in x. Okay, so here's an example uh, of a function. So I've satisfied the condition that for all x and x there exists a y and y, such that this pair lies in f. I've, I've satisfied this by just drawing an arrow starting at every point um, in x. And there's an additional uh, word here, namely unique. So for every x and x there needs to be only a single um, point y and y, such that the pair x comma y is in the relation f. And what this means is that I'm not allowed to have two different arrows starting from the same point in x. For example, having this additional arrow here in red, so this is not allowed because in this case I have two different arrows starting at this point in x. And what this means is that there are actually now two points y and y such that the pair x comma y lies in the relation. But in the definition, I'm requiring that this y that I'm mapping this point x to be unique. So there's only allowed to be at most one of them. And in fact, there has to be one for every x and x. Um, and that's uh, what we want from a function. So this red type of arrow, this is not allowed because uh, we're not allowed to have two different arrows starting at the same point. Okay, so that defines um, our function f here. Now what does this condition that we just uh, checked here mean? Well, it means that basically if we start at a point um, in x, we can somehow find a single arrow that goes um, from x to a point in y. So every, every point in x is mapped um, to a unique point in y via the relation. And this somehow captures the idea of, of some sort of process where the elements in x here um, are like the inputs to the process and the elements in y are the outputs to the process. And what the definition of a function is saying is that for each input element, we know what its corresponding output is. And moreover, every input element has only one output. So somehow this process is deterministic in the sense that if you give it a specific input, it will always return the same output. Now, because there's no ambiguity in what the output will be, we can actually adopt a different notation for functions. So in the case of relations, we wrote things like the pair x comma y lies in the relation f. However, now it's the case that for every x, there exists a unique y that, uh, such that this pair here lies in the relation. And this means we can now write things like f of x is equal to y. And this captures the idea of applying this process to an input element x. So we're applying f to x and we get an output y. 
And this notation here only makes sense because uh, we're speaking of a function. For general relations, this notation wouldn't make sense because there might, for example, be no elements y that satisfy uh, this, or there might be several. Now some additional terminology here. So x here is called the domain of our function, while y will be called the codomain. So these are the same terms we used for relations. So because a function is just a relation, a function also has a domain and a codomain. OK, we now move on to defining certain uh, properties of functions. For this, we'll need the concept of an image. So this is exactly the same as for relations. There we also saw the idea of having a, a range or an image of a relation. So the image of a function is just the set of all elements small y and the set capital Y, such that the pair x comma y lies in f. So similar to when we did this for relations, if our function maybe looks like like this, so we are have we have some points here, and uh, we map them uh, like this, and I have some additional points here in y, then the image is just the set of points that are uh, mapped to so that there's an, an incoming arrow to those points. So all these uh, points here in, in the red shaded region would be the image of f. Finally, we'll define two properties for functions, namely injectivity and surjectivity. So the first property here, injectivity, says that for every uh, y in y, there exists at most one x in x that maps to it, so that uh, f of x is equal to y. So here I'll give you an example of a injective function and an example of a function that is not injective. So this function I'm drawing here is injective, whereas the function I'm drawing now is not injective. And the reason this function here is not injective is because there's uh, two elements here uh, in x that map to the same y. Whereas in injectivity, we want that for every y, there is at most one x that maps to it. So here in the example of the injective function, if I check out this y, I see there's at most one element in x that maps to it. And here, there's also at most one that maps to it. And here, there's also at most one because there's, there's none. Whereas in this case, uh, this is the problematic point over here because there's two elements of x that map to this uh, single point. And that means that this function here is not injective. So this one is an example of an injective function and this one is not injective. Okay, so that's the definition. What does it mean? Well, injectivity somehow means that your process, if you think about the function as a process, doesn't identify um, input elements. So it means that you can somehow trace back where um, the outputs came from. So in this example, let's say I receive an output, uh, this output here from my function. Well, then I know that it has to have come from this input. And similarly for this output, I know that it has to have come from this input. Um, on the other hand, this output I'll never receive because it's not in the image of the function. So here in the case of an injective function, I can somehow um, determine, given the output of the function, what its input was. Whereas in the non-injective case, this is no longer possible because if I say get this output, I don't know if it came either from this input or from this input. This means that for an injective function, you can invert the function on its image. So for every point in the image of the function, so in the outputs you actually can receive, you can say where that point uh, originally came from. And in fact, that process will again define a function, but it'll be a function going from the image of your original function to the domain of your original function. Finally, we move to our last property, which is called surjectivity. So we call a function surjective if its image is the entire codomain set y. In other words, every element in y is mapped to by the function. 
So here's an example of a surjective function. So here I just need to ensure that well, for every point in uh, the codomain, I have an arrow that goes to it like this. So this is surjective because if I check um, every element here in the codomain, I see that there's at least one arrow going to it. Or another way of seeing it is that if I draw the image here, so I, I check all of the points that uh, have an arrow going to it, it's actually the entire set Y. In this case, this function is not injective because there are in fact two arrows going to this point. So this is a function that is surjective but not injective. On the other hand, this function I'm about to draw here. So let's say this one here like that. And now I put an additional point here. Um, this one would not be surjective because its image is just uh, these two points here. And uh, there's an additional point in Y which is not covered by the function. So there's no point in X which maps to this point, which means that, uh, yeah, there's a point in Y which does not lie in the image of F. So this is not surjective. So that's the definition of surjectivity. In this process picture of a function, what does it mean? Well, it means that basically any output you could have um, can be obtained by some input to the process. So in this case here, let's say I want to get this output. Well, then I can find some input to the process that will give it to me. On the other hand, here in this case where it's not surjective, there exists some output here that isn't actually a real output of the process because there is no input that will actually give me this element. The last thing I'll mention is that we call a function bijective if it is both injective and surjective. So we saw examples that showed that you can have any combination of being injective or surjective or non-injective and non-surjective. But in the special case where you're both injective and surjective, we call the function bijective. And the reason is that this is sort of a, a very nice case. So um, if the function is to be injective, then every element in set Y can have at most one arrow going to it. Whereas if the function is to be surjective, then every element in Y needs to have, well, at least one arrow going to it. So in fact, in the bijective case, every element in Y will have exactly one arrow going to it. So this means that uh, we have this situation here where basically every element in Y has exactly one arrow going to it. And what this means is that, in fact, in, in this case where you have finitely many points in each of the sets, that these, these numbers have to be the same. So here, if I have four points here, I also need to have four points here if the function is to be bijective. Visually, a bijective function is a function that doesn't collapse any two points into a single point, and it also covers the entire uh, codomain set. Another way to think about bijective functions is that they are somehow just relabeling the, the points in your set. So here, these points in X have certain names, and uh, here, these points in Y have other names. And here, we're somehow just relabeling this point to this point, this point to this point, and so on. So in this sense, the function isn't really doing much. It's just somehow changing the names of, of the elements. OK, so I've now moved over to VS Code, where I've created a script called functions.hs. Now, similar to the last video, we're going to re-import all of the functions we wrote in the video on sets. So for this, I've put the module setList.hs into the same directory as this functions.hs script. And I'm now going to uh, type the import statement for it. So import setList. Um, recall from the last video on relations that setList is basically just the script we wrote in the sets video, but it has this uh, module setList where at the beginning of it, which defines its, uh, its name. And if we define uh, a module like this and we give the file that it sits in the same name and that file is in the same directory, then we can import it into, uh, into our script like this. The easiest way for you to get this set up is probably to go to the GitHub directory 
which is linked in the description of this video and download uh, this file setlists.hs and put it in the same folder as the script you're working on. And then you should be able to import it like I did here. The warning here is that this might not work uh, directly in VS Code, so you might get like a red squiggle under the module name, which just means that uh, somehow the indexing or something in VS Code hasn't worked quite right because you just added this file uh, new to the folder. So in this case, you should um, restart VS Code, so you quit completely out of the program and reopen it, and then it'll like uh, analyze what files are in the folder or something, and uh, then it should work with this uh, with this import statement. If you're having trouble with this import process, also see the beginning of the video on relations. So that's Haskell 7 implementing relations for more detailed instructions. There I also show you exactly which functions uh, we'll, we need. And so in principle, you could also just uh, type uh, those function definitions at the beginning uh, of the script. While we're at it, we're also going to import uh, nub again from data.list. So recall that the nub function is uh, the function that uh, takes a list and returns only the unique uh, values occurring in that list. While we imported nub in, in the set list module, if you import a module which imports stuff that the importing isn't transitive, so you don't get like all the stuff that your module also imported. So we have to re-import nub here if we want to use it. Okay. So with that, we're going to start out by defining uh, a new data type for functions that implement functions as sets of pairs, similar to the case where we defined relations. So in principle, we could just reuse our uh, relations data type from the last video, because functions are just special types of relations. However, in this video, I want to additionally keep track of the codomain and the domain of the function explicitly. So we're going to add this to our data type so that we um, have it bundled together with the function. This means that the definition will be somewhat similar to that of relations. So we'll uh, call this fun, data fun a, b. Um, so it has two type parameters, a and b. And we'll have a, a single uh, data constructor called fun. However, this constructor will have several fields. And uh, this is something I believe we haven't seen yet. So this constructor will take uh, several arguments, not just uh, one. So the first argument the constructor takes will be a set um, of type well, A, and the second will be a set of type B. So the first field here will describe the domain of the function, whereas the second field will describe the codomain. And finally, the, the last um, field here will be a set of pairs where the first um, element of the pair is of type A and the second one is of type B. So this will implement the, the relation, so the mapping from the, the A's to the B's. And as always, I'm going to derive show so that we can print um, these uh, objects to the console. Okay, so I'm going to save my script and I'm going to open a new terminal at the folder I'm located in and run ghci like this. And now I'm going to load the script uh, functions.hs, and it's going to compile fine. That's good. So I'm going to demonstrate how you uh, construct an, an object of type fun. So you use the fun constructor, and then you need to basically give it three arguments. So the first argument would be a set, which uh, describes the domain of the function. So here I'll just have the set containing the numbers 1 and 2. I can use the set constructor because I've imported all of the stuff from the set list, which in particular includes the data type set. Um, then I need to define a codomain. So I'll have this be uh, the set containing, let's say, the characters A and B, like this. And finally, I need to um, give a set of pairs which describe the mapping between uh, these two things. So let's say that one maps to, to A, and two, let's say, also maps to the character A. Okay, and uh, this thing is now an object of type uh, fun. So the domain is just the set containing the points one and two, and the codomain is the set containing the points uh, character A and character B. And here you see that uh, Haskell has actually abbreviated this list of characters here as a string, so that's a bit weird in this case, but, but okay. And uh, then we have this uh, set of pairs happening. Um, 
So these pairs are just uh, pairs that describe the well, the pairs in the relation. Now, if you notice, um, the data type for functions isn't actually enforcing that these objects be functions. For example, I can map the point one to two different points, so to A and to B at the same time, and Haskell won't complain about it. So we don't actually have any constraints here on uh, that this thing we're defining actually defines a function. In fact, one of the uh, functions we'll be writing will be to check whether an object of type fun is actually a function. Now, what do we do if we want to get the individual fields of an object of type fun? Well, one way to do it is to use pattern matching. So I can use uh, pattern matching to define, for example, a function called DOM, which will give me the domain of a function. So it'll take a fun AB and return a set A. And what does the DOM function do? Well, so it'll take something which I'm going to pattern match. So it'll be an object of type fun. Let's call this uh, maybe uh, D, C, and P for D for domain, C for codomain, and P for pairs. So here D will pattern match this first set, C will pattern match the second set, and P will match this third set occurring in the, in the fun uh, data constructor. So in this case, this will just be equal to D. So here I'm just uh, picking out the first field in functions. So that's what uh, DOM will return. For instance, so if I save and reload here, um, I can uh, take this function I've defined uh, previously and apply uh, this DOM to it. And uh, let's maybe add brackets just to be sure that this will work like this. Okay. And you see what I get back is uh, the set containing the, the, the points one and two. So this is working as intended. Now, because we'll often want to get the fields of, uh, of the function, in principle, we would define uh, like these types of uh, unpacking functions for every field. Uh, this is a bit tedious if you have a lot of fields. So here I would have to write three different functions to unpack an object of type fun. Uh, luckily, there is a nice uh, feature in Haskell called record syntax, which um, automatically creates these functions for you if you define your type in a specific way. So for this, I'm going to now call these uh, things here uh, prime. So this will be fun prime, AB and DOM prime, and so on, because I'm now going to actually, um, I'm now going to define a new version of fun AB. Uh, which will be the version we'll actually be using in the video. So the syntax uh, called record syntax works as follows. So you again put the, uh, the data constructor, um, but now instead of separating your fields just by spaces, you put them in uh, curly brackets, and then you uh, write uh, the names of the fields explicitly, like so you give them names. So I'm going to call this DOM is, uh, is of type set A, uh, codomain, so is of type set B. And finally, pairs, I'm going to call this pairs, is of type uh, set of pairs uh, A and B, like this. So you can see the similarity between these two definitions. So here I also have three fields, but in this case, I'm separating them by commas in these curly uh, brackets, and I'm giving the, each of the fields a name. So the first field is called the DOM, the second one is called COD, and the third one is called pairs. And here these type uh, declarations um, are basically what the original constructor up here had as fields. Again, I'll be uh, deriving a show like this. Now here it's maybe good to also just put these things on uh, separate lines to make things a bit more readable. So we can have it uh, be formatted something like this. And then we see that we have three fields, uh, like each starting on a new line. OK, so now the advantage of uh, this type of record syntax is that, in fact, it automatically gives these field names and is also going to create functions with these corresponding field names that extract that field from the data type.
So if I now save and reload and I redefine an object of type fun like this, let's say uh, this is now, well, an object of type fun, but now defined using record syntax because I've called the other one fun prime. I can now use the field names, like for example, uh, codomain here on this object. And this will just return uh, the codomain in this case. Or I could also call pairs on an object of type fun and it would return this third set. So that's just a nice feature that uh, removes the need to write these uh, functions which extract the fields from your data type. We'll now move on to our first task, which is to write a function which checks if an object of type fun is actually a function. So, so far in our uh, type declaration, we're not enforcing any constraints. And so we actually need a way to check that the thing we're defining is actually a function. So check if, uh, if a fun is actually a function. Now this task is actually more tricky than it might appear at first sight. So we'll split it up into a bunch of subtasks, so smaller functions which perform uh, those tasks for us. Now remember from the definition of function from earlier that in order to be a function, we need that every x in the domain maps to a unique y in the codomain. So our first goal will be to write a function which takes some x which lies in the domain and checks whether there is a unique y which it maps to via the set of pairs defined in the function. Okay, so I'm going to start out by uh, defining a helper function. So this will be called get pairs like this, and it'll take an object of type fun ab and it's going to just return the, the underlying list of pairs in that function. So what will get pairs do? So get pairs of f uh, will be equal to, so we're going to, well, first get the pairs out of the function, but then we need to convert that from a set into a list. And remember that we had this function called unset in uh, the uh, set list module. So we're going to unset the pairs of f like this. So this will just be a useful helper function that allows us to extract the list of pairs that defines the function. Okay, uh, the next uh, function that we'll write is, will be called numUnique. And what it's going to do is it's going to uh, count the number of unique elements in a list. So it's going to take a list of A's uh, where the A's are of type class ek A and it's going to output a number, namely an int. And so here I want to, uh, well, calculate the number of unique items in a list. So you can uh, think about doing this on your own. Um, the hint I'll give you is that you can use the nub function together with another existing function for lists in order to accomplish this. Okay, so I hope you've thought about this on your own. Now, uh, numUnique will, uh, will just be a composition of two existing functions, namely of the nub function and the length function. So if I'm given a list, uh, let's say L, numUnique of L will be uh, just length of the nub of L. So nub L here will return a list with all the unique elements in L in them, and then length will just count those. Now, in fact, here, and also in the get pairs function, you can see that basically we're just defining a new function in terms of a composite of two existing ones. So we're not actually doing anything new, we're just composing two existing functions and giving that thing a new name. And this is convenient because well, we don't always want to type this longer expression. We'd rather type this thing, which is more descriptive of what the composition is actually doing. However, in this case, we don't actually need to give it an argument. So here I'm saying what it's doing on a specific list. But in fact, I could just say that this new function is in fact just the composite of the two uh, functions length and nub. And the way to write this in Haskell is using this dot, which is pronounced after. So it's saying that num unique is equal to length after nub. 
So first perform nub on whatever argument you're giving and then perform length. So this is completely equivalent to what I wrote before. Um, so the thing before was of this form. So you have like first you apply this and then you apply that to the result. Um, this composition operator here does exactly that. It's just a more concise way of defining a new name for a composite function like this. So here I'll just uh, give you the two different options of doing it. It's basically uh, up to your personal preference which one you like better. But I quite like uh, this composition uh, operation um, when, when you are just like renaming the composite of some functions. Okay, so maybe let's save and reload the script to test out this num unique uh, function. So num unique of let's say the list containing one, one, two, and three should return three because there's three unique elements in there. Whereas if I do num unique, let's say of the list containing just ones, that should just return one because there's just a single element in that list that uh, disregards duplicates. Okay, moving on, we'll define another helper function which we'll need, which I'm going to call numwise. So numwise will be a function that calculates the number of y's which a specific x maps to. The reason this will be useful is because, well, we'll want that number to be exactly one for each x in our domain. So it's going to take something of uh, type fun a b, and it's also going to take something of type a, so that's the specific x we're going to be checking, and then it's going to return a number, namely the number of y's which that x maps to. Okay, so I'll give you some time to think about this on your own. So the hint I'm going to give is that you should try to use a list comprehension which goes through all the pairs in the function. So you can use the get pairs helper function to get those. And for each of these pairs that occurs in the list of pairs of the function, you should, well, count the number of uniquely occurring y's where x forms the first component of those pairs. In other words, you go through all the pairs in the function and you need to, well, only select those pairs which contain the argument x, we're giving this numwise as its first component, and then you count the number of unique y's that occur as second components of those pairs. Okay, so I hope you've given this some thought. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So numwise again takes an argument uh, f, that's the object of type fun, and it also takes some x which we want to well, check what the number of y's is that x maps to. I'm now going to uh, write a list comprehension. So the list comprehension is going to range over pairs x prime y prime, and these pairs will come from get pairs f, like this. So I'm going to get all the pairs from my, my function, and I only want to select those where x prime is actually equal to the argument x I'm interested in. So this will now loop over all um, pairs where the first component of the pairs is equal to the argument x I'm supplying. Now for each of those pairs, I want to extract um, the second component y prime. So it's possible that there are actually no such pairs occurring in the function. In this case, that wouldn't actually be a function because we'd have an x in the, in the domain that doesn't map to any y. It's also possible that there are uh, several distinct pairs um, with the same first component. In that case, it also wouldn't be a function because there would be, well, uh, many ways of mapping that x to a y. So here I'm just going to get the number of unique uh, elements in this list. So that will be basically count all of the different y primes that uh, x maps to. And now here I need to add some typing constraints. So I'll need to add ek a and ek b because uh, we're going to, uh, well, we need to check whether x is equal to x prime here. So that requires ek a and num unique itself uh, needs uh, equality. So uh, in order to get the unique elements here, y, we also need uh, ek b. 
So this function here now takes a, an existing object of type fun and an argument x, and it returns the number of y primes such that y prime occurs as the second component of the pairs where the first component is x, or in other words, this is just the number of y's which that specific x maps to via these pairs that define the function. So now we can use this uh, numy's function here to define a function called isfun, which will check whether a given object of type fun is indeed a function. So it'll be uh, isfun will be a function which takes a fun ab and it'll return a Boolean value, which will be true precisely when it's a function. So the idea here is that we want to go through each x in the domain of the function and check that the number of y's for that x is exactly 1. And that will check that for each x in the domain there exists a unique y that that x maps to. So I'll let you think about how you would implement this. So the idea if you want to check something for all um, x in the domain, that again sounds like a quantifier which kind of translates to list comprehension in Haskell. So I would suggest you use list comprehension together with and. So remember that and is a function which takes a list of booleans and returns true precisely when all of the elements of the list are true. Okay, so I hope you've given this some thought on your own. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So is fun will take some function f and the condition we're going to check is the, the following. So we're going to uh, iterate over all x's uh, occurring in the domain um, of f. However, here domain of f will return a set, so we can actually uh, use this in the list comprehension directly. So I need to uh, unset uh, this domain of f in order to uh, iterate over all the x's occurring there. And now for each x in this domain set, I'm going to check that the numwise um, that x maps to under f, so that's numwise fx, that this is equal exactly to 1. Now I need some additional uh, typing constraints here. I need the same ones uh, as I had in numwise uh, in order to make this work properly. Okay, so let's review this definition here. So it says is fun f is equal to and, so this checks that all of the values of the following list are true. So I want all of these values to be true, namely that for all x in my domain, I want that the numwise that x maps to under f is precisely equal to 1. So this translates the statement that for all x in the domain there exists a unique y that x maps to. Okay, so let's save this and um, check some examples using this uh, is fun. So maybe here it's best to just uh, define some functions uh, directly in Haskell in the script so that uh, we can reuse them. So the first one I'm going to define is going to in fact be a function. So it's going to be something going from the set 1, 2, um, let's say to the set, um, let's maybe do again a, b like this. And uh, its set of pairs will be the following. So it'll be a list of pairs and we're going to map 1 uh, to a, and we're going to map 2 to b, okay? So this thing is indeed a function if you think about it. On the other hand, I'm going to write something called not f, uh, which will not be a function. So I'm going to copy the same definition, but I'm going to now uh, map 1 in the first case to a and also 1 to b. So that'll be uh, something that's not a function. Okay, so now let's uh, save and reload our script. And now I can check is fun um, f will return true because that is indeed a function, whereas is fun not f will return false because this condition here is violated, namely the num y's that uh, x maps to in this case one is actually two. We can actually explicitly check this. So num y's um, of not f uh, one is equal to two. So that's uh, what goes wrong here. Now, in fact, our is fun function here isn't perfect yet because there's one problem which it cannot yet detect. 
So suppose I would define a function like this. So I would say one maps to A and two maps to a character C. Okay. So in this case, if I reload my script, so I saved and reloaded, and I now check whether is fun uh, not f, um, this still returns true. So is fun thinks that this thing here is actually a function, but the problem is that I'm actually mapping this this element too to some element which doesn't occur in my codomain set. The reason we maybe didn't think about checking this additional condition that all of the well. Um, elements you're mapping to actually need to be contained in the codomain. The reason this wasn't so apparent is because it was kind of hidden in the definition of a function we gave in the beginning of the video. So there I said that a function is a relation. Um, so it's a subset of x times y, so of the domain times the codomain. And so in that definition, we're already presupposing that, well, these pairs need to be a subset of the Cartesian product of, uh, well, these two sets, the domain and the codomain. So this situation can not actually occur because this thing isn't even a relation um, from x to y. However, here in Haskell, we have uh, no way to enforce this in our typing. And uh, therefore, we can have things which aren't actually functions cropping up, even though we checked the, the condition for, for being a function. So the way to fix this is we need to check that the image of uh, whatever relation this thing here defines is actually a subset of the, the codomain that we uh, give here to the function. Okay, so for this, we're going to define a new um, function called imfun, which will calculate the image of a function. And then we can use this up here in our um, isfun function to check that the image of the function is actually a subset of the codomain. Okay, so imfun will have the following type signature. So it has some typing constraint ek b, but uh, then it takes a, a fun from a to b, and it'll return a set of b's, which is the image set of the function. So I'll give you a moment to think about this on your own. My hint here is to use list comprehension. So you should iterate over all the pairs in the function and just get the second components. Uh, we actually wrote a similar or basically the same function for relations already. So what you get from the list comprehension will be a list. So you need to convert it to a set. And remember that we had this function called to set, uh, which converted a list to a set while removing duplicates. Okay, so I hope you've had some time to think about this. So I'm going to uh, give the solution. So imfun of f well, if we do it with list comprehension, it'll work as follows. So we want to iterate over all the pairs x, y in uh, get pairs uh, like this, get pairs f. And then I just want to get all the y's. So I want to get the second components. But then I want to additionally convert this to a set. And I can do this using uh, the two set function we defined in set list module. Now using imfun, we can actually, uh, well, give the condition that will exclude not f from being a function. So if I now save and uh, reload my script, and I uh, do imfun of not f, I see that it's actually the set containing the characters a and c, which in this case is not a subset of the, the codomain that I uh, said I want for the function. So I can now actually uh, add this additional condition here in the is fun function. So I additionally, aside from this uh, uniqueness condition here, I additionally now want that imfun of f should be a subset of the codomain of f. And we had this uh, predefined function subset in our uh, set list module. So imfun should be a subset of the codomain of f. And also, we want this other condition here, which uh, is the uniqueness. Okay. So here we can see actually that uh, one advantage of having, uh, well, Haskell be a declarative language means that you can uh, use functions you define later in your script earlier in your script. So it doesn't matter that I'm defining imfun here after isfun, I can use it up here already if I want to. Okay, so let's uh, check uh, by reloading uh, whether 
now not f uh, still registers as a function. So if I now do is fun not f like this, I see it returns false. And the reason for this is that the image of not f is not a subset of the codomain. Okay, so let's uh, review what we've did. So the the first task here was to check whether an object of type fun is actually a function. So that's uh, indeed what we've accomplished. So we first define this helper function, get pairs, then we define this helper function that gives us the number of unique elements in a list. We use this then to get the number of y's that a specific x maps to in the function. We could then use all of these helper functions together with the im function here, which gives us the image of a function to check whether a given uh, object of type fun is actually a function. Okay, so this is really kind of a new thing. So uh, get the image um, of a function. So that's uh, necessary here for uh, checking whether a thing is a function, but it's really kind of a separate task. Okay, so we now move on to um, checking properties of functions. So we're going to now check whether a function is injective or surjective. So let me put that here. So we're going to now check if a function is injective or surjective. And in fact, the, the, the second one, so checking surjectivity will be much easier to, to define than uh, checking injectivity. So we'll start with that. So I'm going to define a function called is surge. And it will be something that takes a fun AB and it'll return a Boolean value. So it'll return true if the function is surjective and false otherwise. So I'll now give you a moment to think about on your own how you would define this. So the hint here uh, basically gives away the solution, which is that which is that the definition of surjectivity says that a function is surjective precisely when the image of the function is equal to the codomain of the function. Okay, so with that, I'll proceed to the solution, which basically just uh, does that. So is surjective f, well, what is this equal to? Well, I just want to check whether the image of the function f is equal to the codomain of the function f. And uh, that will, in fact, uh, already conclude the definition of this surjectivity check. Now, uh, in order to check equality here, I need to also include ek b because I'm comparing um, objects of type uh, B here using equality. So for instance, we can uh, now check whether this function here is uh, surjective. So uh, reloading, if I do is surge uh, F, I get that it is in fact surjective because you see, can see that here one is mapped to A and two is mapped to B. So I have uh, points mapping to both uh, elements here of the codomain. Maybe I define here instead of not f, let's call this g, and I'll make it a non surjective function. So if both 1 and 2 map to a, so reloading, I do is surge of g, I get false because here this function is indeed not surjective because b doesn't have any element of x mapping to it. Next, let's turn to checking injectivity. So this will be a function called is inj for is injective. And it'll have, uh, again, some typing constraints, uh, ek a and ek b. Uh, it'll take a fun a b and return a bool. And now recall that the definition of injectivity says that for every um, element in the codomain y, there is at most one x mapping to it. So it's possible that there are zero x's mapping to it, but uh, there might also be uh, one but never more than one. So this condition is very similar to the condition we needed to check in the case where we were checking that something is a function. So in fact, we could accomplish checking this condition by uh, writing a similar definition to this num y's. So we would call this maybe num x's and that will calculate all of the x's that map to a given y. And we would want that to be less than or equal to one. So let's maybe uh, do that strategy. So I'm going to also define a function here called num x's, and it'll take a fun a b, and it'll also take something of type b. So that's the specific y we want to uh, investigate, and it'll return a number, namely the number of x's that map to that y. 
So I'll now give you some time to think about this on your own. So if you want, you can implement this helper function numx's uh, in a similar manner to numy's. So I'll show you the definition for numy's again. So uh, yeah, you could pause the video and, uh, and uh, check this out and try to replace some x's with y's in order to get the right type of thing. Um, okay, and um, then you could use this to then check injectivity. On the other hand, if you want, you can also just write a function for injectivity checking that does all of this in the function body, that's also fine. Okay, I'll now proceed to the solution. So this numx's function here um, takes an f and it also takes a y. And now again, we want to uh, do a list comprehension that will range over all pairs x prime, uh, y prime in the get pairs uh, f. So uh, that'll uh, get me all the pairs, but I only want to now uh, look at those pairs where the second component y prime is actually equal to y. So this will range over all pairs in the function that have y as the second component and now I want to see how many uh, x's occur as the first component. So I'm going to now use num unique uh, on this list here. And I'll need some additional typing constraints. Uh, so I'll need ek a and ek b in order to make this work. So this function num x's will give me the number of x's which map to a specific y. Therefore, I can now uh, use this to implement the is injective function. So is inj f. So here I want to uh, check the following condition using a list comprehension. So I'm going to uh, first iterate over all y's in the uh, codomain of our function. So the codomain is given by the uh, cod f like this, but I need to now unset this because the thing is a set. So this converts the codomain set into a list, which I can now iterate over in my list comprehension. And now what do I want to check? Well, I want to check that the num x's of f y, so the number of x's that y is mapped to in the function f, so this should be less than or equal to one for all, um, for all y. Okay, and I want this for all y, so I use and to check that all of those Boolean values are in fact true. Okay, so let's uh, save and reload our script to check whether this function seems to work. So I'm going to check uh, is injective on the function f here, and I get true, and indeed, uh, this function is injective because one maps to a and two maps to b, so there's no point in the codomain, which is mapped to by two different uh, x's. On the other hand, g should not be injective because this point a here is mapped to by two uh, different x's. So if I do is inch g, I get false as expected. The final thing we'll do in this video is we're going to write uh, conversion functions. So we're going to write a function which converts a existing Haskell function, so that's something of type A to B, into an object of type fun. And then we'll also write a function which converts an object of type fun into a Haskell function. So let's start with uh, the conversion function that takes an existing Haskell function and converts it to an object of type fun. So this will have sort of a long type signature. So we're going to first take an object which is a function from A to B. So this is like the existing type for Haskell functions. And then we'll also take a list of A's, which will um, be the domain of our uh, function. And we'll take a list of B's, which will be the codomain of our function. And finally, we output an object of type fun AB like this. Now here, in order for this to work, we also need to enforce ek A and ek B. Okay, so to fun should take, again, it should take some existing Haskell function together with a list of A's, which should be uh, thought of as the domain for the object of type fun, a list of B's, which will um, be then the codomain for this object of type fun, and then we want to convert all of this data into uh, the corresponding uh, object of type fun. 
Okay, so I'll give you a moment to think about how you would do this on your own. My hint here is that, well, we're already given the lists for the domains and the codomains, so we just need to convert those to sets. Um, you should use, of course, the, the fun uh, data constructor in order to construct an object of type fun, just like we did down here. So this is how you construct an object of type fun if you're given these explicit uh, domain and codomain sets, but now here we are doing it like in a more general fashion. And then the, well, the difficult part of this is to get this set of pairs here. And I would suggest in order to get the set of pairs, you use a list comprehension. And while the set of pairs can be defined using this, uh, this function you're given as an argument, this Haskell function. Okay, so I hope that you've had some time to think about this. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So to fun will take three arguments. The first one is f, which is now a Haskell function. It'll take s, which is this list of uh, a's, and the t, which is a list of b's. Okay, and what am I going to do with them? Well, I'm going to construct an object of type fun using the fun data constructor. And its first uh, argument will be two set uh, of s. So I'm going to convert this list of a's s into a set using two set. And that will form the domain of my function. And similarly, I'm going to convert t to a set, and that will form the codomain of my function. Now, the last thing I need to supply is this list of pairs. And this I can uh, get using list comprehension. So uh, for this, I'll uh, loop over all um, um, elements x in the domain set. And I want to create pairs where x is the first component and the second component is what x maps to. And well, what does x map to? Well, x maps to f of x, uh, where f is this function that I'm supplying and I want to convert into an object of type fun. Okay, so this list comprehension here gives me a list of pairs where the first component ranges in uh, through all elements in this uh, list of a's that I'm supplying, which is the domain of my function. And the second component will be whatever that uh, element maps to under f. Now I need to convert this also to a set, and uh, that concludes the, the definition for this conversion here. Okay, so let's uh, check out whether this works. I'm going to reload and uh, type in to fun, and let's uh, convert the, the square function into an object of type fun. So I go first supply f, which is in this case just the square function. So here this is a partial evaluation, which uh, is the function which just squares any number I give it. And next I need to supply a list of, uh, of a's, let's say one, two, three, like this. And then I need to supply a, a uh, list which will form the, the codomain. And in this case, I'll have it be the list going from one to nine, like this. And you can see if I apply this, what I get is a object of type fun, where the domain is the set containing uh, the list one, two, three. The codomain is the set of the numbers from one to nine. And uh, the set of pairs is, well, the pair one, one. So one maps to one, two, four, two maps to four, and three, nine, three maps to nine. So that's exactly what we want. Now there's a slight problem with this conversion, namely that I could give it a inadequate codomain. So if I just give it, let's say, the, the list containing the uh, numbers one through six, then it'll still convert this into an object of type fun, but this thing won't actually be a function because uh, we see the, the, the codomain here is just the numbers from one to six, whereas here I have this pair that maps three to nine, which, uh, well, is not part of the Cartesian product of these two sets. So nine here is not an element of the codomain. So this conversion can actually produce um, cases where we don't actually have a function. If you wanted to remedy this, you could check uh, whether, well, uh, this is actually a good uh, codomain set and otherwise return an error, but that is uh, more involved in what I want to show here. Okay, and now the last uh, function we're going to write is called from fun, and it will, uh, well, convert an object of type fun into a uh, Haskell function. So how does this work? So we take a fun a, b, and what we're going to return is a function from a to b, like this. In fact, these brackets here are redundant, 
I could, in principle, uh, remove them and it would mean the same thing, but I'm going to leave them like this just uh, for conceptual clarity. Okay, so the idea is we want to define a function, like a Haskell function from A to B. So in order to do this, I need to say what F does on any uh, element uh, occurring in A. And the way I'm going to well, do this is I'm going to use the, the definition given to me by this object of type fun. So I'll give you a moment to think about this on your own. My hint is to uh, use list comprehension to get all the y's that a specific x which you feed the function maps to. And once you have this list, you can just take the, the first element of it using head. All right, I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So fun fun will basically just take a f, which will be of type fun ab. But now because I need to define a function, so a Haskell function going from a to b, I also need to give it an argument x, which is of type a. So I want to say what this thing, so this thing here will return a Haskell function. I'm going to define it by saying what it does on each x. And well, what does x map to? Well, the way I'm going to figure this out is I'm going to iterate through all the pairs x prime y prime that occur uh, in, in get pairs um, f like this, but I'm only going to select those where x prime is actually uh, equal to the argument x I'm supplying. And well, then I want to check like which y prime corresponds to that, to that uh, x. So here I'm going through all the pairs in the in the pairs of the function. I'm only selecting those where the first argument is x. And then I want to uh, get to, well the second component of those pairs. And now if the thing is actually a function, then this list will contain exactly one uh, element y. And so I can just get that using head. So head will give me the first uh, element of this list. And well, if it's actually a function, this list should have exactly one element occurring in it. And now uh, this equality here is underlined in red because I need to actually uh, be able to check equality on x in order to do this. And so I'll uh, add this ek a type constraint to my function definition. Okay, so let's uh, conclude by, by uh, checking out this thing. So I'll just convert f into, uh, into a f prime, which will be defined as um, from fun f like this. So I'm defining a new function f prime, which is just, uh, well, uh, f converted to a normal Haskell function. If I now save and reload, I can now see what f prime does on various elements. So if I do f prime of one, it should return the character a, that's good. If I return the character b, that's also good. And now if I try to apply it to something that, well, isn't in my domain, um, then I'll get an exception. The reason is that, uh, well, head here is then uh, handed an empty list. So there are no actually, there are no pairs um, x prime, y prime, such that four is the first component of that pair. So this thing will be an empty list here and then head can't actually get a first element from that. But at least on the, the elements that the Haskell object fun is defined on, I can now evaluate fun prime. Okay. With that, I'm done with what I wanted to present in this video. So we've seen how we can implement functions as sets of pairs in Haskell. Obviously, this isn't the best way to deal with functions because Haskell already has this built-in function type, which you should use in all cases. Nonetheless, I hope that the, this uh, video illustrated um, some more Haskell concepts, gave you some additional practice, and um, also gave you some uh, more uh, intuition on how functions work.